Hi there, my name's Vince from MyMateVince.com and in this video today is another trying to fix video and in this video we're going to be trying to fix a couple or maybe making one out of two bad bush boom boxes, CD players. So these were sent to me by Stuart from Infinite Bargains. Now you might remember that name before, he sent me the flip clock radio. Remember that one where the numbers actually flipped round so it was like an old-fashioned one but it was a, a new copy of an old one so basically uh, these are available currently in Argos for £25 and you can get them in a variety of different colours so they're the sort of things that lots of parents will probably be buying for their children now reading the reviews like always they're mixed reviews a lot of people are saying the sound is really very bad and a lot of people are saying what a load of junk that basically they just stop working after a day or two or work for 15 minutes then the CD stop, stop playing etc but obviously on the flip side you will then have hundreds and hundreds of positive five star reviews so like always people are happy until something breaks and when something breaks they just think it's a piece of junk when in fairness it could be just you know, it's just bad luck, isn't it, sometimes, if a component goes faulty. So uh, he sent me two of them. Apparently, one doesn't play CDs, and the other one doesn't have sound. Now, he hasn't checked out the one that doesn't have sound. He has the one on the CD, uh, doesn't play CDs, and apparently it's not like a loose connection or anything like that. All the ribbon cables are apparently uh, connected up. But the one on the speaker, he hasn't actually checked out, but he has done in the past, and normally it's not the speakers that are faulty, it's something on the board. So out of the two of them, personally I would prefer to look at the one with the sound issue because apparently it's got no sound across the CD, the aux in, the Bluetooth, across anything. So I think that's going to be the more interesting one out of the two. So uh, let's open them up and see, uh, see what's what. So this is a pink one here, but although they're going to be different colours, it doesn't make a difference because the insides should be the same. And if I can't get them working, I am willing to go to Argos. There's one uh, nearby to me, and I can look in there. I've already checked a few days ago before the madness of Black Friday, and uh, uh, they have them in there. So if I can't get either of these working for the purpose of sort of proving a fault, I will happily spend £25 to uh, buy one. Okay, so there's already return labels on here, and it says here, not playing CDs. And this one here is a silver one, and this says turns on but produces no sound. Right, let's uh, open them up. Ah, oh, right, he did say he was going to put something in. So hold on, what is, oh, it's a USB drive. Oh, how good is that? I do love my minis. I've owned, hold on, how many minis have I owned? I had a silver Clubman that never made it on the road, and then I had a, a Mini City, which I uh, made more retro looking by putting chrome everywhere on it. That was a lovely car. And then I had a brown Mini Clubman Estate. Now, that was a sight to behold. Look at that. So that's a four gigabyte mini USB 2 drive. Let me just see how that works. I can't see anything sticking out. I can see a little lever underneath, so you must uh, you must push it out. Oh, thanks, Stuart. I'm presuming this one's working. <laughs> well, do you know what? I didn't actually ask. He didn't tell me. Maybe it's. Uh, oops! I just broke the box. Maybe it's. Uh, maybe it's a faulty one. Oh, now that is good. That is good. Now, did you know minis years ago, because they were all about utilising the space in them, so for example, you could fit bottles of wine in the door uh, bins and stuff like that, but on the very old minis, this was really nice. The boot used to hinge downwards, and the top of the number plate used to hinge out this way, so you could drive along with something sticking out of your boot and still have your number plate on display. So towards the end, mini boots just sort of fell down like this, but the early ones, when they came down, the number plate hinged up. It's little touches like that that make them such a good car. I don't know how feel, safe I'd feel in them nowadays, but when I was young, loads of people had them. Got to admit, that is nice. Right, okay, let's uh, let's get on to the, uh, the fix it, and I can test out that little mini uh, the USB thing later on. Right, so here we have it here. Actually, it feels quite a bit of weight to it. And we have a power cable. 
and I'm thinking they probably, yeah, they accept batteries as well. So one, two, three, four, so eight C type batteries. Right, and this is like a Barbie pink one. So I'm thinking between the two, I should be able to get one working, because if one doesn't play CDs but has sound and one doesn't have sound, then in theory we should be able to swap things about, shouldn't we? Sorry, I was just looking off camera, and uh, there's a little pack here as well, with a little bag. Do you know what? I have got a SanDisk, is it? I think a 60, uh, 64 gigabyte one. Look at that, that actually feels really nice. Oh, that's a nice little bag, isn't it? Do you know what I could do? I wonder whether this, I wonder whether this could be a little, uh, just thinking out aloud, whether it could be a video or not. Changing it out, you know, opening it up and changing it out to make this 64 gigabytes, to make it more usable than, for example, four gigabytes. Take the inside of my one and put it onto here. I wonder whether it would be easy enough just to swap out. That's an idea. Look, looks like the, this looks like an advertisement now. It's not, but look, you can get the Monte Carlo Rally, Mini Cooper Racing, and a Fire Chief Mini Cooper. So all different ones, and this one as well. This one, see, mine never had that grill. This is the, this is an older model. I don't know whether this would be a Mark One, but this is. I think my memory probably uh, is completely wrong, but I think that's called a moustache grill. And the grills that I had were more angular, so I always wanted one of these because they just look so much nicer. So basically, you know the minis from the Italian job, such a good film. They are lovely, but unfortunately, they're just so expensive now. So when I was younger, they were expensive because I was young, but they weren't actually that expensive. But now they really are expensive. So I, I don't reckon you'd get much change out of, well, I'm completely guessing, but I don't think you'd probably get much change out of 20,000 pounds. Right, let's, uh, let's test these. I'm just gonna test these off camera now, just to make sure they are, you know, 40 like they're supposed to be. Right, okay, so it definitely is as described. So if you have a look here, we're playing track two. Volume is up full, and it makes no difference. It's not even, there's not even any static or anything. If we go to the next one, it definitely is recognising the CDs, and it is playing them. Yes, yeah, so we're on track three now. Uh, if I was to, for example, go, uh, let me just stop that, and also you can see it's spinning. If I was to stop this, stop, and go over to the radio, which is that one, you can hear there's no static, there's no nothing. So my initial thinking is, could it be something to do with the volume? Switch. Now with this one over here, the radio definitely works. Look, I've got it tuned in. Even though, look, you can't see what you're tuned into. There is no, uh, there, you don't know what station, oh, actually you do, it's there. Okay, so that's how you know what station you're on because there's a dial there. But if you listen, I've just tuned this one in. Yeah. So, uh, I've got to be really careful on this video uh, regards the uh, the sound because otherwise it would just be automatically flagged up. Nobody will be looking at it to flag it up. It would just be automatically flagged by uh, YouTube. But the CD here definitely isn't working. Now, what is horrible is this opening mechanism. If you do it really slow, it's okay. You know, you think it'd be a push in and open up one. But if you, uh, uh, when you go to open it most of the time, you just kind of, you just yank it open and it just skips through the gears down here, so it's horrible. But if you look here, if I now put it on to CD, hold on, CD, it will spin, there you go, but it won't come up here as being recognised. So, well it says 20, but watch this now, if I go to next, it will just flash on that, and it won't actually play it. And if I put the volume up, the volume's up full now. See, it's gone back to 20. There's definitely a CD issue there. So I think what we're going to start is, let's start on the silver one, because you know what? I'm not a lover of messing around with the, uh, the, the, the lasers and stuff like that. But what I can do is, let's see if we can get this working. If we can get this working, then, for example, we might be able to swap the laser out with this one, and we might be able to prove whether it's a laser fault or something else. That's why I wanted two. Originally, Stuart was just going to send me, I think it was this one, but then I said I'd probably have to buy one to be able to prove the fault, and then he said he had a, a you know another one lying around, so that's why he sent me that one. So let's start with this fella here. Okay, so I've unplugged it from the power supply. So now it's going to be safe to work, and I've got to double check 
if there's any uh, big capacitors in there that can still give me a shock. Okay, so the four long screws were here, here, here and here, and the two short screws were here and here. So now let's open this up and see what's, uh, what's, oh, see what's happening. All right, let's see what we're joined, joined by. Okay, so there's a ribbon cable here. So let's undo that ribbon cable and then that should give us a bit more room. So it's just one of those ones that you just pull in and out. Oh, that's on the laser. In fact, I'm gonna pull it out from the board here because there'd be, uh, it'd be easier to put back in than messing with the laser. All right, so this is what Stuart means by he's checked all the cables are connected. So let's unplug this one. There we go. And let's unplug. Now we've got to make sure that's the right way round. Do you see what I mean? There's a twist on that now, isn't there? Would it have been like that originally? Right, we should be able to see which way the, the contacts are in here and that will give us a clue. I wonder whether it could have been from the factory. I wonder whether they, they test it in the factory or not. Right, that's out and this one's out. Right, so we've got it in two halves now. The top half and the bottom half. I can feel a little bit of grease. I'm just going to get some uh, kitchen roll. Right, so first of all, I'm just going to have a look in here see where the contacts are. Right, so the contacts in this one are facing upwards. Now, here the contacts are facing... Hold on, I've got mixed up now on what's what. One second. That goes that way round, so... Hmm. I should have taken more note. I can watch back the video, but we've got two ribbon cables that are the same. Oh no, they're not. One's thicker than the other. Okay, and that's the thin one. Right, so that one there has to have a twist on it. So that is correct to be twisted. And that one there will go in, again, contacts facing up. So that does look like it was in the right, uh, that does look like it was in the right spot. I wonder whether this side has been done correctly or not. So let's uh, take this ribbon cable out. So there's two little tabs that we just have to push back. Here and here. Oops, that's come right the way out, so that's not good. No, oh, that's snapped. That's snapped now, so I'm going to have to do some work on that one. I should be okay, though, because I can put that back in with the other side, wherever it's gone. Here. And I can just use a bit of, uh, a bit of glue or even a bit of tape over that, so that should be okay. Right, so there was no sound to this at all, so it does look like the ribbon cables were actually okay. I'm just going to check them, the condition of them. Do you know what? That reminds me of, I think, the Dreamcast one. Yeah, I can test for continuity between there anyway, but I'm trying to think what's going to be responsible for the sound. So this is getting plugged into this board here. Here, so there's going to be something on here which is responsible for making the sound. So I suppose we better get this board out. And also I've got to check this capacitor here to see what charge is in that. That's only 25 volt. Right, so we've got the power going in here, it goes into that little transformer there, and it comes out on these two yellow ones here. So let's unplug that. And so everything on here then should be low voltage, shouldn't it? Right, and that is uh, what we've got here. So when you plug in, oh look, so when you plug in, it cuts the power so then you can use the batteries. Let's see what happens, how does that work? Oh look, there's a tiny little... Yeah, look, you see there's like a little switch on top there, and if you look at the, it's going to be hard to see, but up here at the top, there is a little black thing, 
and uh, apologies you can't see that I don't think but when you press it in so in other words when you put the cable in basically this switch will short together so if we push that in there can you see that's now shorted let's get the multimeter so that's when it knows uh, to use the batteries so now these two should be uh... right so they're together and now when we unplug that it goes yep so that's using the battery I see so basically the wire from the battery is just getting connected into the board here so it looks like then there's always 240 volts going no of course you're not going to have to yes yeah, so every time something's plugged into there it's uh... One second now. Yeah, so every time you have something plugged in, it breaks the connection. Yeah, which makes sense, doesn't it? Right, okay, that's uh, that's that part done. That's, that's got nothing to do with the actual fault. So now, this is soldered on here, so I'm still restricted. Right, okay, so this is the uh, the board here so let's zoom in I'm thinking that must be the Bluetooth module because it looks like it's kind of been put in afterwards as an afterthought so I'm wondering whether this board has been around for a long time and they've just updated it to put Bluetooth into it to make it more modern as you can see you see it's like a cheaply made thing but it is cheap it's 25 pound and when you think that's traveled from probably China and uh, the shop has to make their profit the manufacturer has to make their profit and everybody else along the way then you know it's got to be made pretty cheap hasn't it now so there must be some audio chip on here which is responsible for responsible for the audio now it could be a speaker thing but Stuart did say that most of the time it's not the speakers at fault but you know what we can check the speakers can't we we can check the speakers by just doing an ohm test on them so let's get that out of the way now so these speakers here say 4 ohm 3 watts so if I go between the black and red it should be measuring 4 ohms and if it is that will say to me that the speakers are okay so I'm going between black and white and then I'll do black and red the other side there you go 4 ohms 4.34 so there's a lot of glare with these lights okay so we know that that speaker is okay so now let's go to the other one the red and black for the other speaker yeah so to me it's not worth swapping the uh, it's not worth swapping the speakers over to from the other one because I don't think that's gonna I don't think that's gonna be at fault Now, I suppose that it, there is a chance, uh, I'm trying to think now. Okay, well look, I'll tell you what, I thought it was the volume thing to begin with, didn't I? So let's just start with the volume and we'll see what's happening here. So if I go between, there we go, let's take that off there. If I go between some of these pads, wow, there's loads of them. Why is there so many pads on here? I thought there would have only been two or three. Uh, why is there so many? Why would you need so many? Is it for each? Would, would each of the things? Do you need like a one volume for the aux, one volume for the Bluetooth, one volume for the CD, one for the radio? Seems a bit weird. One, two, three, four, five. There's six of them, and then it looks like there's two ground ones as well. And if you look really closely here, it actually tells you what it is. It says VR1, so variable resistor 1, and it says R1212G. Right, if I'm honest, I don't know how to test that, so I'm just going to mess around a little bit with the uh, ohm reading. Uh, I don't know whether you have to go between a ground and one of them. I'm just going to go between different ones and see what happens. Right, okay, I think it is working. Let, let me zoom out and show you. So now, I've just gone between these two pins. As I say, I don't know why there is so many pins. But watch this now. At the moment, we're at uh, 2 ohms. And now, as I start... Uh, right, okay, so that's all the way 
to the extreme that side and it's two ohms. Now watch this, as I start going round it will start moving. So you see it's gone up to 135 and now we've gone to kilo ohms, so that's 747 ohms and now we've gone to uh, 3 kilo ohms, so 3200 yeah, so you can see as I'm moving it around, it is climbing. So I think that is working. And all the way to that side, so it goes to 21 kilo ohms. Now, that is just on those ones there. Let's see what happens if I put it on a few of the others. Right, so that just looks like it's uh, a short. So let's go to continuity, yeah. So that's a short. Maybe every every other one's a short. So yeah, so that's changing as well. I think I think that variable resistor or whatever it is is working okay. Is what I think. I'm still confused why there's so many so many like outputs on it. Well, what I'm going to do is I am going to let's see what I can do here well I'm gonna get my bench power supply so we're looking at 8 times uh, hold on 2468 8 times 1.5 so we're looking at 12 volts I'm gonna get my bench power supply and put 12 volts into this here and here and then uh, that way then I don't have to worry about the uh, 240 volt side of it and I think I'm gonna wiggle around a few things just to see if uh, do you know what I mean? Just in case it is a bad connection here, and by me pulling on it and stuff, it might suddenly start working, and then it might give me a clue as to what the fault is. Because right now, it doesn't seem like anything obvious to me. I know I haven't really done any proper testing yet, but the first impressions are not uh, are not are not obvious. I'm just separate, separating it out to make it easier to work when it's uh, you know uh, not all put back together. So I don't think I need to worry about the CD side of it. So I think I'm just going to leave that because remember on this one the CD is working. I just want to have a look at what's on the other side of this board here. Okay, so there's little buttons there, so they would be easy to clean if you need it to. And you see there, 2016. So I don't really think I need to worry about that. I can't see anything there causing an issue with the audio. Well I'm not sure about the ribbon cable on this side now because there seems to be contacts top and bottom. Can you see? I'm going to have a look from my eye loop just to see what's going on. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, well, I put them to the top to begin with, and then see uh, see if the front bit lights up. If not, I'll, uh, I'll put them to the bottom. So I am going to have to put this thing back in, aren't I? Ah, oh, I've just whacked that straight off there. Do you know what? I didn't even use that much strength on that. Oh, look at that. That's come straight off. Right, that's going to take some uh, soldering back on. Luckily, it looks like the pins... Luckily, it looks like all the pads are still there. That's weird, isn't it? you think that would have ripped some of the pads off. Right, okay. Haven't had much luck, luck with that connector, so I uh, I don't think I've been particularly rough with it. When I took that off, it just snapped, and now trying to get the cable back in, it just uh, it just came off. Right, let's uh, let's not worry about that because that is just a display anyway. So I'm thinking the radio and stuff will still work without that. So let's plug in. Let's plug in the speakers and I'm going to get my power supply on this and then we'll see by wiggling things around if it will come to life and what we'll do is we'll put it on radio because radio is going to be the thing that has the most amount of static so it's going to be the easiest thing to hear.
Okay, so I've got the bench power supply set up for 12 volts DC, and if you have a look, I know it's 12 volts because there's eight of them times 1.5 is 12, but as well as that, you can see it's in series, not parallel. So we've got negative, positive, negative, positive. Can you see the positive then is that actually joins to the negative here, yeah? So can you see, it's just like you're lining up a big line of batteries. Then when we get to here, that's separated from that, that's joined to that one. And then it goes this way, and again, positive to negative. So you can see it's just like having eight batteries all in one big line, so that's how I know it's 12 volts. Right, so this side here is gonna be positive, and this side's gonna be negative. Let's just double check, yep. Yeah. And they've got the, the leads on the right way, so black's negative, red's positive. Let's now pop this on. I'm just gonna double check with my meter that it is 12 volts. Okay, 11.9, just up it a tiny bit. Here we go. I'm happy with that 12.1. There we go. Now that shorted for a little second when I did that. Hmm. Right now, uh, I wonder, could that be the fault? No, but saying that is 12 volts now. Because the beep would stay on, wouldn't it? Do you know what? Let me just double check that. Right, so we've got that going to here. And that should be getting passed through. And that then goes to here. Yeah. And then the black goes to here. Yeah, they're definitely not shorting. Right, so what I'm going to do now is, I'm just going to have a wiggle around the place and just to see if there's any way I can get sound out of it. Well, okay, well, it's definitely nothing obvious that I can see. So I think it's time to take apart the pink one. And then I'm going to try the pink front on this. I mean, I'm certain that this has nothing to do with the lack of audio. But I need to double check that, don't I? And then if I know it's purely on this board, I can start comparing between the both of them. Because if you were doing this like for a living, then you would just put the laser from here in the pink one and you would just have the pink one working and you might not waste your time on something that can be bought for £25. But for me, I do actually want to find out what the problem is and then if I find out what the problem is, it's going to help other people because other people will also have this issue because looking on Argos reviews, there's quite a few of them that has this issue and also Stuart said it as well. So it'd be nice to actually prove what the fault is. Now we have got a crystal here. I wonder, could it be a dodgy crystal? Weird thing is, there's absolutely no... Uh, there's nothing at all, is there? Interesting one, though, to try and find the problem. So I'm going to start to take apart the pink one now and mix and match so I can have a bit more idea of what's going on. First of all, I'm just going to put the speakers and this front board on. Well, I'm just going to put the speakers onto here, then see if we've got it. Then that eliminates the front board, doesn't it? Yeah, that also shorts it just for a split second. Yeah, there we go. Right, so it's got nothing to do with the front board, has it? Because we've got this completely disconnected and it's still there. Uh, it's still doing it. So that's good, it means it's easy to fault find, so we can fault find purely on the board now itself. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to get measurements between here and here, see if I can find out, see if anything looks different between them. 
So basically, if I didn't have two boards to play with, there would be zero chance of me getting this working because it's not anything obvious as far as I can see, like a faulty ribbon cable or anything like that. But hopefully now, because I've got a good board, this remember this was one with a faulty laser, but the rest appears to be okay. So that means then I can take measurements between here and here to see where the difference is. has got the same bottom bit as that 40RC car that I had so if I can't get one of these working I might be able to just use the aerial for that if the uh, if, if my fix ever fails I'm just going to write good on this board here so I don't get them mixed up so now what I'm going to be doing is just go in between them and seeing if I can work out what's happening struggling on this one because I can't find any differences between the two. This is the good board here and this is the bad board. The only thing I've really found is the fact that there is solder missing from this one here. If you have a look you can see it's kind of like missed it out there but yet there's continuity between here and the actual pin up here. So basically even though it's not a clean solder joint that's uh, it's still in contact so I don't think that will really make a difference. I will fill it with solder but I don't think it's going to do anything. I've been basically trying to work my way back from this speaker connector here because this is where the two speakers go into and they do appear to be going into this chip there's a chip underneath this heat sink here and if you have a look it says very closely it says TAB227 or TA8227 I'm not too sure but it is labelled up just there so I'm wondering whether or not it could be a faulty chip under here but again maybe I can swap it with this one uh, I've gone across all the diodes using diode test on my meter and they're all showing exactly the same as this one here. That's the Xena diodes, the diodes, anything that looks like a, a diode. Uh, and I've been using ESR on the caps and they've been coming up okay. So I'm not really too sure what the problem is on, at this moment in time. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look up these chips to find out which is the audio chip and maybe that will point me in the right direction. So I'm going to type in that number there to find out what this chip is here. So as soon as I know something I will report back. Right so the very first chip I typed in because this one under the heatsink is the one that I think will be the audio IC because it is closest to where the speaker connects and that's where the, the tracers go to. So I typed in that number T a8227 and look I've got this data sheet up it's a Toshiba chip and it says here low frequency power amplifier TA8227P is an audio power IC with built-in two channels developed for portable radio cassette tape recorder with power on and off switch so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that chip out and swap it with the other one because it's kind of pointless fault finding something for ages if that chip is going to be faulty and if you think about it audio is not working on anything the radio the uh, the CD I mean I haven't checked the other things I'm just taking Stuart's word for it that the other that is not going to work on the aux in or the Bluetooth but I think all things point to this chip so let's start here swap it over and see if that fixes the problem okay so we're going to be unsoldering these here and then I'm going to take this chip off and then hopefully I'm going to take the chip off the good board and then put it on here and then we'll see if we have anything. If we do, it means that chip is 40 and you can buy these off eBay quite cheaply from China for under two pounds. I haven't looked at UK sellers yet, but hopefully someone like CPC or Farnell or someone on eBay, I'm sure will have them. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna do that. Another thing I could do before unsoldering it, but I haven't got it set up, is uh, when I did a Walkman video ages ago, I had a few messages, one in particular from Standish Geezer, who basically told me how to make a probe. So I've already got this like speaker amplifier thing, and I can put a 3.5 millimeter jack into that. And then out of that, I have two wires, 
uh, well, 3.5 millimeter, use two of the wires, ground one of them, so I could just use a ground, and then I can probe the other one on different points. So for example, if I was to probe where the speaker is, in theory, I should get sound. And if I don't, I can start working my way back. And that then might tell me where the faulty component is, or possibly there might be a faulty trace here, which my eyes haven't picked up on. It just all looks so new, I think it's gonna be unlikely. But anyway, there doesn't seem to be a huge amount between here and the speaker thing. So let's take this off and then see what happens. So I've got my soldering iron set to 400 degrees C and I've got my solder sucker here. I'm just gonna put my fan on and I'm gonna to try to remove this. Let's plug this back in and see if that's fixed it or not. You can see how much solder came out there. No. It's not that chip. Oh, well what is it? Oh, do you know what? I really don't know what to. Uh, really don't know where to go from here. What could it be? So it's not the audio chip. So I might as well put this in the other board. So we've eliminated that. What on earth could be causing this? Kind of reached my limits of uh, of understanding. So if it's not the audio chip, I can't find anything wrong with the capacitors or the diodes can't see anything obvious don't really know where to go from here if I'm honest with you do you know what whenever I see little crystals like this I might just try swapping the crystal over just in case because the crystals are often used for the timing of the chip so uh, just in case it was dropped and the crystal mucked up but mind you it is it is playing and stuff isn't it it wouldn't play the CD if the chip was out I don't think Mind you, it is an easy thing to swap over. Uh, I think it's just going to be trial and error on this one, swapping things over until it until I see what uh, see what works. So, luckily, I have got this one. If I didn't have this one, I'd be completely stuffed because I would have just bought one of them on eBay, thinking it was that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to start swapping components over just to try and prove what is causing this problem. Okay, so I changed over that crystal. This one was also marked up as a crystal. This was marked up as X3. Doesn't look like a crystal though, but then again, I don't know. And it says, uh, I mean, it has got a megahertz thing there. It says uh, 8.4672 megahertz that on there. And I've also changed over I'm not too sure, some sort of transistor or voltage regulator type thing. Uh, now, let's see if that's made a difference. No, nothing. Hmm. The more time I'm spending on it, the, the more I want to know what it is that's causing it. 
See, normally it's a chip that's failed, isn't it? Normally, unless it's a capacitor, but these are really too new, and none of them are bulging. I can't see any any of these. I can't see any bulges in any of them. None of them look like they've leaked. So I think it'd be highly unlikely, unless of course it was a faulty batch or something. I'm going to get my multimeter and just check for voltages around the place, see if I can work out anything. I've been messing around with the voltages on the good one on the chips and I've written them all down here. And now I'm going across the bad one and the voltages are completely different so that's good at least I've sort of found a difference between them now apart from the fact that the difference is it's not working electrically I found a difference so if I go between the grounds which is uh, this one here so let's just leave that probe there you can see that going into the chip that we should have 12 volts and we have we've got 11.7 so uh, yeah I'm happy with that but on this next pin up we should have 5.4 volts but we haven't we've got 0.26 volts so not even one volt next one up we should have 10 volts and we haven't we've got 0.9 then up here these read the same well this one doesn't this should be 5.4 here next to the big ground and you see it's just a 0.5 and then that one reads the same we should have a 0 0.64 0 0.37 there's not much in it is there and this one is 0 0.01 and again you can see there's uh, nothing there this one should be 0 0.01 nothing there this one should be 0.63 uh, again but then remember that could be because I've got the volume slightly different this one here is just a ground with that this one should be 10.6 we've got 0.9 this one should be 5.5 we've got 0.3 and this one should be 10.9 volts and we've only got 0.3 nine seven but yet we know because in my this is the good audio chip in here because I've uh, uh, the the bad board originally now has uh, the the uh, I took the audio chip from there and put it into here I didn't desolder it again and yet this is working fine so we know the audio chip is okay so what I have to do now is try to find out why we're not getting voltages on for example that second pin now immediately it would make you think that is something to do with the chip but I'm, uh, I don't think it is. I think it's, I, I need to trace where the things go to because there's numerous capacitors and stuff around here. So uh, yeah, that's what I'm currently working on. Okay, I am not getting anywhere here. Basically, the good board is still good and the bad board is still bad. I've swapped over the crystal here and the crystal here from each board. I've swapped over this thing, that voltage regulator thing. I've swapped over five of the big caps near the bottom of the audio chip because you remember this is where we're not getting the voltages so I thought just in case they're all testing okay but anyway I've swapped them board to board and this board is still okay I've even now swapped over the volume control even though I tested it and as far as I can see it's working okay so I think now the time has come to start swapping over some of the chips I mean I've tested things like that transistor there if it is a transistor uh, I don't want to take off every single capacitor. I mean, they're new, so I, I think it's going to be unlikely. I think uh, I think I'm going to start doing chips. Sorry, I've also changed over this thing here and this thing here as well, and it hasn't made any difference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change over this, 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 and this, and see if that makes any difference. Then I'll go for the big one here in the middle. So. I'm, uh, I'm just going to change them all at once while I've got the hot air on it and then if it works then I can start kind of putting them on one by one to see which is the faulty one. I've tested all these big diodes as well, they're all testing the same from board to board. There's some here and there's one here as well. Basically everything I'm testing so far is testing exactly the same on each board but obviously there's something majorly wrong with this one. I just uh, I can't seem to pinpoint what it is.
Right, okay, so this is the bad board with those chips changed over. Let's turn it on and see what happens. Still nothing. Wow. Right, okay, let's see if the other board's working just in case I've mucked up something. Right, still working, so it's not, it's none of those chips, unless it's that big one. Oh my word, I was sure it was gonna be one of those chips. I'm running out of things to change over. Do you know what, after all this, it will probably end up being something really obvious, and a lot of you probably already know what that is. Right, so I am now gonna change over this massive chip here, and see if that makes any difference or not. I was sure one of those other ones was gonna do it. I've got my temperature at 350 degrees Celsius and I've got the airflow 3 out of 8. Right, okay, I've swapped them over, but the, let's call it the good chip on the bad board, uh, there's lots of bridges on it, so this one actually looks okay, but this one doesn't, so I'm going to have to get a soldering iron and just go around it. Let me zoom in to show you. Right, so this is the bad chip on the good board, and that actually is, looks completely correct, but this one is all over the place, so... You can see that is bridged up here and stuff. So I'm going to get my soldering iron and I'm just going to uh, drag it across and hopefully that will get rid of those bridges. There's quite a few of them. I'm just going to have a close look at that. Lovely. Right, that's come out nice. Remember, I haven't cleaned the fucks off it yet. But I'm happy with that. They're all on their pads and they all look like they're joined. So now, let's pop it in and see what happens. Right, so to begin with, I'm going to start on the original good board, but let's call it now the bad chip. So I've still got 12 volts 
coming through here. Okay, we've got sound. Ah, that's not good. So basically, that's all the chips from the faulty board on the good board now, and there's still sound. So now I'm pretty sure that this is still not going to work, which I suppose is a good thing because it means it must be something more simple. The only problem is I've run out of ideas. Right, let's see now. Nothing. What on earth could this be? What on earth is it? It can't be the switch because when I put it onto CD, it was it was spinning, but it's not. Uh, there's still no sound, so it's not the switch. Do you know what? I'm I'm pretty much changed everything on here. I'd love to know what this is. Well, I say I've changed everything. I haven't. There's a multitude of capacitors and resistors and diodes and everything else underneath, but I can't change every single one of them. Uh, thing is, I can't even test every single capacitor. Well, I suppose I could test it for shorts to ground. Wow, what is this? I was sure it was going to be one of the chips. Right, OK, I'll, uh, I'll keep at it and uh, I'll get back to it when I have a bit more information. Okay, I'm slowly working my way through the board. I never thought the switch was faulty, but I need to check it just as a process of elimination. It took me quite a while to work it out. So basically, there's quite a few contacts here, but this row is the one that's in contact with everything. So depending on where the switch is, it will always be this row and one of the others. So when it's all the way over here, to the to, let's say to the right or up this way, it will be between here and here. Then if we move it along, it will be between here and here and here and here. Move it along one more, it will be here and here, here and here. One more and it will be here and here. So basically this one is always the one that's in contact with the others. So if you have a listen there and there and then move it along one, just one, hold on. One. Now you see it's no longer there, it's jumped to here. And here. One more and it becomes here and here. And that one there becomes here and here. And that's testing exactly the same as the good board, so I definitely know it's not the switch. Now I just need to find out what it is. Right, OK, I have found something that's different. I don't know whether it's the fault or not, but it's certainly different. So basically what I've been doing is I've been tracing it from the power cable here, and I've been going this way already up to the audio chip, but it also, from here, travels up along through this diode. It goes up here, and it goes via one link. Can you see that link that jumps across to there? That's what links up this side of the board, but it also travels down this way and goes to this link here. And from this link, it goes to, you see there, so it goes up around to here, and then it jumps all the way across to here via that long link here. And then from here, it travels all the way over to the switch. So I've been working out how the switch works. You've seen I tested from here this way, but I've also tested from here this way. So for example, I think it's this pin, these pins here, also connect up these two pins when it's over in this side here. And then I, it's been traveling back along here, Sorry, it's been traveling up to these diodes here, which are testing OK. And then from here, it goes all the way along and it goes to this thing here, which says Q23. This black item here, I don't know if it's a transistor or what it is. But basically, this is testing different on the uh, bad board compared to the good board. So, for example, now I'm just on ohms. Let me, uh, I can't really zoom in anymore. So I'm going to go from one side's got one connector here and the other side's got two connectors and it's got 2TY written on it. So I'm going to be going to begin with here to here, then here to here, then there to there. Yeah. So I'm going to be going uh, here to here first. Now if you watch, I'm going to put the red lead on this bit here and this is the faulty board. So between here and here, if you have a look, I've got a short. And if I go between here and here, it's reading 9.5 kilo ohms. 
and if I go between these two, it's reading 9.5. Now I'm just going to swap my leads just to see if it makes any difference. So here to here, I still have a short. Here to here, it should be 9.5. Okay, 9.9, .9. and here to here, 9.9. .9. Now check out the difference here. So we can do exactly the same. Here to here is not a short. Can you see it's completely open? Yeah. And now here to here is also open. Let me just make sure I've got a good connection. Right, there to there. Yeah, I'm putting a lot of pressure on there. I'm definitely making contact. Here to here, nothing. And here to here is 9.9. .9. Swap the leads again. Here to here. Can you see we're in the mega ohms? Here to here. Again, we're in the mega ohms, and it's only between here and here that we've got the 9.9. .9. So that one's definitely testing different. And if you go to continuity, you see we have continuity between here and here, but we haven't got continuity between here and here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the soldering iron. I'm going to try to remove this one, and. Uh, I'm going to try to swap them and see if that makes any difference. So let's zoom in. I'm going to try to do this with the soldering iron. Hopefully, I'll be able to just heat it all up at the same time. All right, so there's this fella here. I'm working on the bad board to begin with. Now, I'm not saying it is the component. Maybe it's something on the pads underneath, but uh, that's the first thing I've found which is different. So right now, I'm really happy. You know, I'm going to have to use hot air on this, I think. There we go. Okay, so I've taken that one off. It actually came off quite easy. Let's do this one now. There we go. Right, let's swap them. I'm just going to get a bit of solder to add to that. Right, okay, so that's the good board now with the possible suspect faulty component. Let's just see what's happening on the pads on this one. So I'm just going to go to continuity. No, so there's nothing there now. Just pop this one on. Right, I think that's taken. 
Right, okay, so now the other, the good board is testing the shorts here, between here and here. Yeah, so now let's see if that has made any difference or not. So let's start with the bad board. This is the first time I've actually been hopeful. Right, so I've got it on the correct setting. Got volume midway, let's turn it on. There we go! Look at that! Amazing! It was just that tiny, tiny little transistor or whatever that little thing is. 2TY. Wow! Now I have to see if I can source one of them. I don't even know what it is though. But listen to that. Yeah, there we go. Let's just touch the aerial. Brilliant. Okay, so let's now go onto the faulty board just to make sure that the... Uh, well, sorry, let's go onto the good board. Remember, this is the faulty board. Let's go onto the good board and make sure it's not working. Then we know 100% it is that. Wow, I thought it was going to be something major, like a big, you know, a big chip. It just shows you one tiny component can uh, render something useless. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. Nothing. So it is that tiny, tiny component. Wow, do you know what? I'm so glad that uh, I found that, but it's taken me a long time to do it. Now, I don't know of a quicker way to do it. I suppose now in hindsight, see I sort of convinced myself it was a chip, but in hindsight I suppose I sp should have spent more time with my multimeter trying to trace where it was going from the, uh, from the power here, because that's what I did, I traced it from the power and like I showed you it went down to here, it went through the switch and then back again to here and it's, uh, it's not then, and if you have a look from here it does kind of make sense because from here you see it goes around, let me get my bearings, it goes around here around, around, up to this capacitor, that's a capacitor here, which then starts to feed everything else, can you see? So, uh, yeah, I have to find out what that is. I'm gonna just do a quick Google test on that. Well, I found them on eBay, and this is from a UK seller, and they're only £2.24 for 10 of them. And you can see they're two TY, and these are the SMD ones. Uh, so surface mount, and it looks like the code is also S8550. Now check out this website. Okay, have a look at this website here, componentsinfo.com. And basically this is the transistor here, and you can see here it's a PNP. And this is the kind of, uh, the normal, you know, the normal through-hole one. But I believe it's the same as the SMD one, but this is interesting. So okay, you can, that doesn't mean much to me, but that will be of interest to other people. But look at this, it says here, where can we use it? And it says it's a general purpose transistor and it says you can use it at the output of your audio amplifier circuits to amplify the output audio signal to one watt. For example, it can be used in electronic doorbell circuits, MP3 audio amplifiers and in the output of buzzer circuits, etc. So there you go, you see? So it is, in this instance, not used as a switch, it's used as an amplifier, which is interesting. Now I am going to buy those ones but what I'm thinking is, if I go to this one here, if you have a look, you can see here that the one is the base, two is the emitter, and three is the collector. So in our circuit, we were having a short between the base and the collector. Now, looking at these things here, I'm wondering whether I can just use one of my ones, just for the time being. I will buy the eBay ones, but I have got this like pack of transistors here. And if you have a look, so we need a PNP. Now the difference between the general purpose PNP here and here, if you have a look, everything's the same apart from this IC Max. This is only 0.2, and this one here is 0.8. And if you have a look here, the I C is collector current continuous. It says here 
minus 0.5 amps. I'm not sure why it's got the minus. They've all got minus before them. Well, not all of them, but all of those ones there. That's confusing me a bit. But I'm wondering then, if I was to put in the 0 0.8 here, would it work? Obviously, it's going to look a bit ugly because it's a through-hole component in a uh, when it should be an SMD. But until the eBay ones arrive, I wonder if I could use this because it's got the collector base emitter. It, it's all labelled up there. And all I have to do is bend them in to the correct ones here. So I'm tempted to give that a go. It's just that those other figures there don't really match here. But uh, I'm thinking if it's a PNP, does it really matter? I mean, like, what I don't understand is the difference between the transistors. Do you know what I mean? I don't know whether, is it just a cost saving thing or is there massive differences between them? Obviously, lots of you are now probably shouting at the screen telling me, yes, Vince, there's lots of differences. But I will order the ones from eBay, but I'm just wondering to get it up and running to begin with, could I just solder one of these in just to see if it will work? Or will it damage it beyond repair? So I'm not sure I need to uh, make a decision on that. Right, OK. I've ordered up 10 of them, because that was the smallest amount, and it's £2.24. So it shows you that, in theory, if Stuart has more of these with this fault, then maybe if it is the same fault, because he said he had quite a few with that fault, if, for example, that was a weak spot on the board, maybe if it was designed badly or something, I don't know, uh, then you'd only be paying like 22p or 23p for uh, for one of them. So you can see it's very cheap. Now I have ordered them. They're going to arrive. It's a UK seller, but they are still going to take two or three days to arrive. So I'm going to take the risk because I was looking up about transistors, and apparently with them, loads of them have quite a lot of an overlap. Now, you know, I freely admit I do not know what I am doing here, but I am going to try to put one of these in place of the surface mount one. The one I'm going for is this one here. Again, it's a PNP and uh, I've just gone for this one over this one because the the, uh, the max one here is more and from memory I think it was 0 0.5 or 0 0.6 for the actual 2TY1. So I'm going to give it a go and then when these arrive then I can solder in one of these. Now I might well completely blow it but that is the risk I'm going to take. For me, it's more about the learning rather than getting two of these working. I'm pretty sure now I will be able to get one of them working. Uh, if I thought this was definitely going to break it, then I wouldn't do it. But I'm thinking I might be OK. So remember, this is just very small because it's surface mount, because it's going to look a lot nicer than this. Now, I've had a look. And basically, on the surface mount one, you've got the collector here, and then you've got the emitter and the base. So basically, on this one here, I've got the collector, the base in the middle, and the emitter. Yeah, on this one here. So this one here is the collector, because it's this way around. Hold on now. Yeah, so if we put the flat side there, you can see that the one on the left-hand side that I've bent back is the collector, middle one's the base, and then the one on the right is the emitter. So all I have to do is do it like that, because you can see collector, emitter, base. Or collector, base, emitter. Yeah? So uh, what I'm going to do is unsolder this one. I'm going to solder this one on, and I'm going to cut those legs right back. In fact, I'm going to cut the legs back before soldering it on. And then, obviously, it will look, uh, look messy, but I just, I just want to see if it's going to work. OK, it looks a mess, but well, actually it doesn't look too bad at all, really. But I think it is on there. It doesn't look like any of them have shorted either. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop this in now and see what happens, see if it's going to blow something or not. Right, here we go, moment of truth. Let's see what's going to happen. Let's turn it on, give it 12 volts. Excellent. And give it a bit more volume. I don't want to go crazy on it because I will be replacing this when the proper ones arrive. Yeah, that's fine. And let's just touch the aerial. There we go. Wow, OK, so it looks like that's going to be working fine now. OK, so I'm going to add a bit of flux to this, and I'm also going to 
run my soldering iron across the connector as well because it all looks very dull and stuff. Now I know I was probably a little bit heavy handed with this but I don't think I was too bad. I think the whole thing looks to be a bit of a bad solder. Well sorry, not the whole thing. This connector here just looks to be a bit dull. When you look at it there it just looks... I don't know, I'm not sure how well that was stuck to begin with because I've undone quite a few ribbon cables now and uh, you know that broke first time and then I didn't really put much force on it and the whole thing just came off. Right, so I'm just going to just tap this with my solder iron. Let's uh, zoom in for this bit. Right, I'm just going to rub my solder iron across this bit as well. Right, now let's turn that round and we'll try to solder this on. Try to get the big ones at the end on. I think the problem is the connectors should be a bit wider. I don't really think the end ones are making a contact at all. Oh, okay, that does appear to be on, so now I just need to run my soldering iron across the pins. Okay, they look like they've all made a connection. I'm just doing a quick tweezer test on them. Just give them a little push to see if they move. I think that's okay. Well, I'm going to give it a clean with some, fl uh, some IPA. Right, okay, that's it. I'm happy with that. So now uh, that's done. Now we have to start looking into why the CD is not working on the pink one. Right, so it's the next day now, feeling nice and refreshed, and basically just to recap where we are. So we know that this whole bottom section here is working, and this board here is working. And with this silver top, it works fine. But with the pink top, it does this. Let me show you. So I've just got my uh, 12 volt leads plugged into it, so it's okay to work on. So can you see it's doing that funny thing with that micro switch? We know it's not definitely not a board issue, it's something to do with this assembly here or possibly one of the cables or something. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm just going to start taking parts off and putting parts from the silver one on until I pinpoint what the fault is, whether it's the middle section, the outer section, and then I can fault find that. And uh, also what I need to do is I need to work on this board here because 
this hasn't got any CD spin at all. It's not doing anything. When I plug this one in, it looks completely dead. So I'm going to have to go across all the chips again and uh, concentrate on this one here in particular and basically see if I've got any lifted pads or something like that. So uh, I think to begin with, I'm going to work on seeing if I can get this working here because if I can't get this working, there's less chance of me even looking at this because there's no point in having a working board if I haven't got a working top for it. But uh, yeah, let's swap parts around, see if we can sort of narrow down the fault and then we can do some proper fault finding on it. So I'm just dismantling the silver one. I've already dismantled the pink one. And I'll quickly show you how to take it apart. So now I have already checked for continuity between the wires. So basically I've just gone on the pins here and the pins here, but I haven't checked this one here because it's slightly harder, but the ribbon cable itself looks fine. So if I thought it was a suspect ribbon cable, I would do that before doing any of this dismantling, but it just looks perfect. So obviously I haven't tested it, so there is a possibility, but I think it's very slim that the ribbon cable is faulty. Right, okay, so that's that part there. So now what we want to do is I want to separate this laser in the middle from this motor assembly here. So what I'm going to do is, there's two little screws underneath here, but very kindly they've put a little hole in the spindle here so you can get to the screws. So if you look there, you can see that it lines up with the uh, screw below it. So we can just go straight through there and do that, which is good. But annoyingly, they haven't done it on the motor over here. So we still have to take apart this assembly here. So with these, there's just these little plastic clips that just get pushed in. There you go. And then this will lift out along with the gears as well. So I should make a note of where those gears go because they fell out on the other side. So that one goes there with the teeth up and the big one goes there. There you go, I think I'll just leave that there so I know how to do the other one. So basically this will now separate both the laser from the motor. There we go. So now what I'm going to do is you can see the uh, laser here. So I'm going to leave it allowable to slide up and down there. Now I'm going to move this one here from the faulty one into here and let's see what happens. In fact, it's moving, I think it's gonna be a laser problem. That's all moving nice and freely. And that all clips in nice. To me that seems seems perfect. All right, so what we have here is the good laser with, let's call it the faulty motor. So now I'm gonna pop this back in and we'll see what's happening. Right, okay. Yeah, that's recognized. Right, so we know it's not the motor assembly. We know now it's something to do with this laser here. So let's take a very close look at it, unless of course it could be this ribbon cable. So before we go any further, let's just swap the ribbon cables over and then we know 100% that it has to be something to do with the laser itself. You can hear that work in there, so 100%, it's not the ribbon cable, it's not the motor assembly, it's definitely this laser here, it's not the board, it's everything to do with this laser here. So now let's uh, have a very close look and see if we can see any difference between the two. So I'm going to take the laser out from here as well, or I might be able to just get measurements from the top, and then uh, see if I can find like a 40 capacitor or... I don't know, there might be a broken wire somewhere down here. Let's just really examine it closely. So this is the laser assembly here, and I can't see anything obviously wrong with it. So what I've done is I've gone from continuity between the actual pins on the ribbon cable right the way through here, 
onto here and right the way through to here. So I've tested between these pins here and these pins here and they're all coming up. Whether they're coming up in the right place or not or whether they're kind of shorting out, I don't know, but there's definitely continuity between pins on here and pins on here. It looks like this is the laser itself. Can you see this uh, part in the middle? And I believe what happens is it shines through and then it goes through this lens here and this focuses up and down. What I've also done is, if you have a look, there's two long wires, one there, one underneath it, one going across here and one underneath it, and they go to this circuit board here. I've also checked for continuity between the wires and the solder joints here. So I believe this is what allows it to focus up and down. What I can't test for at this moment in time, because I haven't disassembled it, is the actual coils. Do you see here? So I presume each of these coils go to one of these wires which go to here. And I think there's a magnet. It looks like there's some kind of magnet thing going at the uh, going at the bottom there. So I think what happens is it must magnetize it or something and pull it this way and pull it up. Do you see what I mean? Depending on where it needs to be to, to read the disc. It must put power into the coil then, which goes against the magnet and then pulls it up or pulls it down. Uh, as far as I can see, it's all okay. I haven't actually tested for continuity between the wires. I'm just going to quickly do that now, actually. There's a little potentiometer for the laser to give power to the laser. And I've measured this one and I've measured the working one. And basically with the working one, the working one is 0.62 kilo ohms, so basically 620 ohms, that's the good laser, and the faulty laser is 645 ohms, so 0.645 kilo ohms. Now, very little in it, but I'm wondering, so basically this is actually putting more power to the laser on the good one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tweak the faulty one from 0.645 to try to get it to 0.62 just to see if that makes any difference, because really, there's nothing else I can do after that, unless I dismantle it, but by dismantling it, you know, I'm not gonna be able to fix the laser, it's some kind of diode, isn't it? So that's not gonna, uh, that's not gonna happen. But anyway, let me just show you. So if I go in between these two here, or from here to here, then it will give me a reading. There you go, so it's 0.645, and that's consistent as well. So I'm not gonna make the same mistake as I did before. I've got my tiny little screwdrivers now. I'm gonna get the screwdriver that fits it perfectly, because on the PSP that I did, I messed it up. Well, I don't actually need one of them. One, of, one for my own set is working okay. It's actually quite a big crosshead on it. Okay, so we've gone the wrong way there. That's 0 0.750, so you can see I'm going out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go counterclockwise, anti-clockwise. Right, we're down to 0 0.63, so that's very close. Let's get it right to 0 0.620 if possible. There we go, 0 0.620, what a result. Okay, so that's what I've been turning here, just this little potentiometer, just here. So you put it in here and just give it a little turn. Right, I'm gonna put this laser back together, see if that's made any difference at all. So that will just give a tiny bit more power to it. I've got it completely out now, so I'm gonna make sure I don't look at that laser, because obviously a laser can damage your eyes very easily. What I've done is I've just put a bit of tin foil just into the switch here, which is like the safety switch when the lid is closed. So I'm gonna turn it on. I just wanna see through the viewfinder if there is any red light on this coming on. I'm turn it on there, and now do the switch here. Right, so I can see it moving. Right, that's fair enough because there's no disc in it. So now let's put our disc in it.
Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah, that looks different. Oh no, I think it's saying no. Yeah, it's saying no, it still doesn't recognise a disc. Right, we have the faulty lens on and I can definitely see a red light. Look. Yeah, let's do that again. Right, this is strange. What could be causing that? Is it possibly misaligned? Do you know what? I might as well get some IPA and just clean the top off that, but I can't see how it's going to make a difference. I can't see how it got dirty already. I mean, it looks perfectly clear, but it's one thing I haven't tried yet. Right, so I've got a Q-tip cotton bud. I'm going to give that lens a clean. And I think I'm going to get some canned air and blow it in there just in case because remember this is just a lens the laser is down you know the diode is down beneath that just in case there's something on top of the diode maybe it's half covered with some grime or a bit of glue or something like that All right, let's blow this right in there well I'm just going to keep messing around with it for a while see if I can work anything out apologies I can't film the whole thing but I have been on this for hours and hours and hours and hours so, uh, yeah, I'll give it a little bit longer. Might even take the laser apart just to see if they're... What I'm wondering is, could it be misaligned? Could it be pointing in the wrong direction? Because it's definitely trying, isn't it? Yeah, I'll get back to this when I have a bit more info. Well, I've tried up in the uh, laser, the power to the laser. So right now I am at... Uh, before it was a point. 620 kilo ohms or 620 ohms and now I've gone to 700, uh, 578 ohms so 0 0.578 kilo ohms let's turn it on and see what's going to happen It's not happy at all, is it? No, still doesn't work. No, right, in my opinion, that was actually worse. So I think I'm going to actually try to lower the power to the laser, see if that makes any difference. to 710 ohms now. No, it's still nothing. Right, I don't think there's any point in wasting any more time with that. So let's uh, think what I should do is actually take apart the laser, just in case there's some sort of alignment issue. Okay, so I'm just dismantling the actual laser. You can see that this is a laser here, and this is the other side of it. And uh, it's pretty amazing. When you look through that lens there, there's like a sort of lens at an angle. And when you actually look through there, it's amazing. You can really see it's like a massive wide angle lens. It's not going to come across in the camera. 
but when you look through there it really is wide angled you can see kind of like when you look around your room it's like you can see kind of near enough a metre either side of that so that's pretty amazing I'm just going to show you this diode, this laser underneath the magnifying glass because I think it's going to look pretty interesting right so I've just got the microscope here not magnifying glass now let's get it lined up so it is I don't know that's a good one right okay so let's go right in so you can actually see a load of wires wires coming from it so let's zoom further into that wow look at that now let's see if we can get any closer oh my look at that wow so how many wires we've got one two three four five six seven eight nine just gonna have a look at the other laser and see if I can see those nine. Yes, you can. So if you were to go onto the uh, the back of the laser here, you've basically got ten pins: five at the bottom, five at the top, and one of them's a ground. So basically, all of those pads go to each of those things in the middle there. Right, let's try and get even closer. Right, that is the closest I can go. But that is pretty impressive. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't really know what's wrong with this. I mean, I've actually gone across a diode test comparing one laser with the other. And basically, they're all reading the same on every single pin. Every pin was, I think, 0.7 something, but one of them was 0.6, and that was the same on both of them. I'm not sure if it is a, an actual diode problem because it is lighting up red. I'm wondering if it's to do with alignment. Maybe it's slightly misaligned and it's not reading it properly. I've also compared distances. So basically I've gone on the distances between this one and this one. So you know, I've kind of had a look here and it's all lining up. The laser looks to be the same height. The spindle seems to be the same height. This is the working one. So between the working one and the faulty one, I can't see any differences whatsoever. So now what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna basically blow some air straight into the lens there. You know, that little right angle bit of pink glass, not right angle, the beveled pink glass and uh, just put it back and may maybe mess around. There is screws in there on the spring, so that must be for alignment. So I think I'm just gonna mess around with that just to see if it is an alignment problem. And then if that doesn't work, unfortunately, I will have to give up because I can't actually prove the fault anymore. I've proved it onto the laser, and as far as I can see, the laser looks okay. There's nothing more I can do about that. Right, okay, it's very unlikely I'm gonna get this fixed now because the ribbon cable connecting this to the board has now come apart. I tried to burn it back to do it again and it was just uh, it was just melting all around the wire. So I'm not sure how you're supposed to strip back ribbon cable after you cut it. I'm not sure how you're uh, supposed to expose the wires. But I think, I think I might know what the problem was. Now, I remember when I first of all looked at this, the laser wasn't perfectly in the middle of this thing here, but I thought this was one molded piece, but it's not. You can actually take this bit out here, and what I think is, could be wrong, but you see there's two tiny little holes here. I'm wondering if originally these two bits of metal were supposed to fit into the holes, but possibly they tried to get an off-the-shelf part or something and it didn't fit. I mean, I don't know. But really, there's nothing, there's no way of judging where that should be. Yes, we've got a hole here at the end, but, I mean, for example, it can be there, and it can also be there. I mean, that's a huge difference. I've moved over a millimetre, and it still hasn't made a difference to that one there. So I think that maybe the whole problem was, because there was definitely a red light, I don't think the laser's faulty. I think it was an alignment issue. And... Uh, I think it's just a case of getting this perfectly aligned so that that laser is bang in the middle of that. That's what I think it is. So I am just going to mess around with uh, trying to get wires onto here, but I'm not going to spend very long on it. You can actually buy lasers. So I've looked up and on the side of this laser is a model number. Right, there is actually a model number just in here going across and basically I've looked it up on eBay and the model number is SF 
dash P one O one N and it's called a CD laser pickup and you get them from China for £2.50 you can get them from the UK for around about £5 hence the reason I don't want to spend too long on this but I'm not even sure if I am going to get the laser because remember I've still got a problem with this board here it's not even spinning the CD so uh, I'm going to mess around with wires just uh, for a time being just to see if I can possibly get some wires on here and then uh, I'll make a decision what I'm going to do about the buying a new laser or not. Well okay so I've soldered some new wires on here it's a bit of a bodge job it's just purely to test it and I just want to show you the difference that moving this little laser makes so you can see it's on a circuit board and I showed you earlier how it can move around so watch this now when I do it like this it will barely move at all it will just do a couple of revolutions and then basically give up Can you see it's not building up speed? Okay, and it's given up already, yeah? So it didn't really even attempt it. So I'm just gonna turn it off. And now watch this. This is why I think it's an alignment issue. So now, let's zoom in. And let's just give this a little wiggle. Let's try to go this way. Can you see there? I'll just move it a tiny bit that way. Now let's see if that makes any difference. Turn it on there, turn it on there. Right, that's still not going to do it. I'm getting used to what it's like now. Yet again, not recognised. So now let's move it more Let's move it more that way. Let's see if that will do anything. There you go. So it's already noisier. So it shows you how important the alignment of that laser is, and I think that's what the problem is. It's just that I'm not going to know how to align it properly. But you can see I haven't messed around with any potentiometers or anything like that. I've just done the alignment. Yeah, and again, it's failed now. So I'm going to do this for a, a bit and see if I can find the place that it's happy with. Right, it's time to give up on that. I can't find the sweet spot on it. So what I'm going to do now is, I know I can buy them on eBay for next to nothing. So I'm going to see if I can get this board working. But because I've been on this so many hours, I'm going to just, uh, I'm not going to spend more than one hour on that board. So you can get the whole assembly from China for £5, or you can get just the laser itself for £2.50. Well, so all I'm going to do is rub the soldering iron along all the chips and then see if that fixes the issue. Right, good news. That has done the trick. So all I did was rub the soldering iron with extra solder between the different pins. And uh, I mean, there was no bridges or anything, but it was, uh, I just added a bit more solder. So there must have been one or two possible ones where the pin was just on the pad rather than properly soldered in. But now have a, have a listen. I can't play anything. Okay, that one skips, let's go to another one. Let's go to another. Go to another. There we go. And stop. Yeah, so that is definitely working. And good news is as well, the display is actually showing correct. It's showing 20. So it looks like on this board here, there's going to... Let's turn that off. 
there's going to be an issue with this connector here. So I'm going to have a look around this one here because when I plug this board into here, the display doesn't work properly. So I'm just going to uh, just check the pins are clean and also just to make sure that the capacitors and the resistors around here are definitely in place. Maybe I knocked something when I was heating the chip up. So I've made up my mind, what I'm going to do is I'm definitely going to buy a laser for £2.50 because I think it's worth having this working for £2.50. I probably won't film a revisit video on it because there's no need. You've seen that I've definitely proved it is the laser. It's a nice easy job to change over. So there's not a lot of point in really filming it. But I have definitely ordered one of those transistors, well 10 of those transistors to swap this one over here. And I am going to order up a laser and then I think I paid two pounds something for that. So it looks like for around five pounds, I will have got both of them working and as well as that, prove the force as well, which is the main thing. So I'm just gonna have a quick look around this connector now and then start putting these back together. And uh, yeah, that will be the end of the video. Right, I think I might have found what the fault might be on the LCD. So basically this is the connector here that the ribbon cable goes into. And most of these pins go to this chip here. But watch this, on one of them, it goes to the pad but not the actual pin. So let me zoom in and show you. Right, so watch this now. I've got my meter on continuity, and I think it was, I think it was this one. Right, so watch there. So can you see there, I've got a continuity between there and the third pad, but watch, not the pin. So I wonder if that's what's gonna be causing it. So let's get the soldering iron and just tap a little bit of solder on here. I'm not going to use flux, I'm only going to just quickly just tap it. Right, let's see if that's made any difference. Right, so we were there, and now. Yeah, now it's doing it on top. I'm going to pop that back in now and see if that's fixed the display. There we go, it has. Look at it. How good is that? One, two, three. So you can see now, nice clear display. So that was me messing around with all the chips and everything. So I have made a lot of work for myself, but I kind of had to do it to uh, eliminate various different faults. You can see play. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this all back together and hopefully then by the end we will have two fully working little bush and boom boxes by the time I get that other transistor and the laser as well. Right, so here it is, SFP101N, and you can see £2.53. I might as well go for the cheapest one, but they don't really go up much from there. £2.60 is absolutely loads of them, £2.70, £2.70. I think the first one from the UK, look how many there are, hold on now. So you can get the whole assembly for around about five pounds. Yeah, that doesn't say from China. Four pounds seventy, item location London. So there you go, four pounds seventy for the whole thing there. If you didn't want to mess around with having to undo the gears and stuff like that, but it's not hard. It isn't hard whatsoever. Uh, but for me, I am just gonna get the laser. Right, so the, uh, the bush boom boxes are back together now. Let me show you them working. Right, so here they are. Obviously, due to copyright, I can't actually show you any music, but if you have a very quick listen to the radio. There we go, that's the radio. And this one here has Adele in it, so let me just play it for a second. You can see it's working there, the display as well. There we go. And this one here is fully working. So the audio was faulty purely because of that tiny little resist, uh, transistor. And that's what I love about messing around with electronics is because look, this massive thing here failed because of that tiny little component that just cost however much it was. I think I got 10 of them for £2.30 or something. So let's say 23p. It's amazing, isn't it? Now this one here, yes, I have to spend £2.50 on it, but I couldn't see how I could fix this. If I had another one, I think I'd have more chance because I wouldn't mess around so much with the cables. I would just try to realign that laser because you've seen how much difference it makes by moving that laser a fraction of a millimeter, made it try and spin to not bother trying at all, just doing a couple of revolutions and saying no disc. So I reckon if I 
hadn't have mucked it up, you know, by messing around with it so much because I was trying to fault find, then I think next time round I'd probably have more luck by just adjusting it ever so slightly. Or it's not that big a deal. Two pound fifty to get it working is okay, but I actually don't think that that laser was faulty. Put your comments down in the uh, uh, down in the comment section to let me know what you think. Do you think the laser was faulty? I mean, it was lighting up red, it was focusing, it recognised that there was a disc in there. So for me, I think that was all to do with an alignment. So yes, I spent a hell of a lot of time on this, but I really enjoyed it, especially because I eventually found the faulty component. Now, for me, it's not really going to pay off because. A video like this isn't going to get a huge amount of views because these things are not that interesting and I spent a lot of time on it. I've spent, if you added up all my hours, I'm sure I've probably spent about six to eight hours on this, which is probably ridiculous. But let's say now for Stuart, if he has a load of these, I'm not saying they will all be that one, but it's worth checking, isn't it? And you never know, that might be a weak link. Maybe something's happening inside, a bit of a surge or something, and maybe that's the first thing to go. I don't know. If it is, it's a nice, easy fix. Now, I might change this out, and it might only last two or three weeks, and then it might go again. It might only last a few hours and then go again. I've had Adele play in for about 45 minutes when I was getting this one back together, and it appears to be working fine at the moment. But I don't know whether it's a bad design or whether it was just a faulty component. But it'd be nice to know now if there was 10 of these with no audio, would they all be that or would it be completely random different things? See, if it was all that, then it is well worth spending the six or eight hours now finding the fault because then you've saved a whole load of these from being thrown in the landfill and obviously they're worth a lot more money working. Not that they're worth a lot of money anyway, they're £25 brand new, so second hand you're probably looking at maybe 10 or £15. But still, when they're broken like this, essentially they're worthless. So uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this video. Thanks a lot for Stuart for sending them over to me. I promise you I will order up the laser for this one. I've already ordered up the transistors, so this will be another working one. I'm going to give this one to my daughter for her room, this one for my son for his room. He likes to listen to you know, the David Walliams uh, audio books. So that's quite good because at the moment he keeps borrowing Chloe's one. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's good. I'm, I'm happy with them. Sound-wise, the reviews are not very good. To me, they sound okay and they actually go quite loud. So I think they probably are worth £25. It's just that I can sort of see that they've been cheaply made because it is a cheap product. So I really don't know how long they're going to last. But if you enjoyed this video, please give it a, a thumbs up and please subscribe for more trying to fix videos. Take care. Bye now.